Hello and welcome to Eastern Europe Review, a program focusing on Belarus, Ukraine and Russia. This is a joint production of Belsat TV and TVP World. My name is Mitsur Mitskevich and here are the main topics. In Chechnya, local pro-Kremlin thugs brutally attacked a Russian lawyer and journalist. It was an attack. According to the official Chechen authorities, they labeled us as provocators. I don't know who they meant by that word. Who will pay for Wagner troops in Belarus? Lukashenko understands that he doesn't need it, that this is a disaster. The Kremlin also doesn't need it. How do Ukrainians react to Belarusian state TV channels? Until February the 24th, for all those years we had daily interactions and we maintained contact with the checkpoint by phone. Russian independent journalist Yelena Milashina was attacked in Chechnya by Kadyrov thugs. She sustained injuries including broken fingers, a cranial cerebral injury and a stab wound. She was on her way to the announcement of the verdict for Zarema Musayeva, the mother of the Chechen oppositionists Abu Bakar and Ibrahim Yangulbaev. Journalist and human rights activist Yelena Milashina faints in the corridor of a Beslan hospital. This is how she looks after unknown men attacked her in the capital of Chechnya. Cropped hair, a green face, multiple bruises and concussion. Upon further examination, the journalist was found to have multiple hematomas. Lawyer Alexander Nemov, who was accompanying the journalist, was stabbed in the leg. While Malashina and Nemov were driving from the airport to the city around 5 in the morning, three cars blocked their way and they were attacked by a group of men wearing balaclavas. They threw the taxi driver out of his car and forced me to kneel, holding a gun to my head. They sort of did everything nervously. They couldn't get our hands tied. The Novaya Gazeta journalist was on her way to the announcement of the verdict for Zarima Musayeva, the mother of the Chechen oppositionists, the Yangulbayev brothers. Alexander Nemov's client was kidnapped by Kadyrov's security forces in January 2022 in Nizhny Novgorod and accused of assaulting a policeman. However, experts believed that this was Kadyrov's personal revenge for the opposition activities of Zarima's sons. Unfortunately, the lawyer and the journalist did not make it to the trial, where an elderly woman with insulin-dependent diabetes was sentenced to five and a half years in prison. It was an attack. According to the official Chechen authorities, they labeled us as provocators. I don't know who they meant by that word. Our version of events is that the attack was a result of our professional activities, both mine and Alexander Nemov's. When they were beating him, they told him directly, you defend too many people here, defend where you belong. You don't need to defend anyone here. Yelena Milashina has been writing about corruption and human rights abuses in the North Caucasus for the past 20 years. In January of last year, Ramzan Kadyrov referred to Milashina and other human rights activists as terrorists and publicly called for their arrest by law enforcement. The journalist had previously experienced an attack in Grozny three years ago, and Kadyrov publicly issued threats against her. I'm tired of this. If you want us to commit a crime and become criminals, then say so. Someone will take on this burden of responsibility and they will be punished. The beating of the journalist and lawyer was condemned by various entities, including the Russian parliament, the Union of Journalists of Russia and the Human Rights Council under the president of Russia. The Kremlin also made comments regarding the incident. The investigative committee initiated a criminal case only a day later. However, what stands out is the choice of articles they used, specifically those related to the infliction of light and moderate bodily harm. Despite the alleged order from the head of Chechnya for his security forces to sort it out, many activists still consider Ramzan Kadyrov to be the mastermind behind the attack on Malashina and Nemov, on the other hand, Chechen officials attribute the incident to the alleged involvement of Western special services. Considering the global events unfolding during the special military operation, it cannot be ruled out that the authors of the attack scenario aim to further discredit our country ahead of the upcoming NATO summit in Vilnius. 
The characteristic involvement of Western intelligence services can be clearly seen here. At the same time, Chechen opposition figures claim that the responsibility for the attack lies with the Kremlin. Naturally, the forces behind this crime are attributed to those that Vladimir Putin has been cultivating for over 20 years following the occupation of our country. It is Moscow that is responsible for what is happening today in Chechnya. According to Zakayev, the incident will not have any impact on Kadyrov himself. He also believes that the public should not expect Kadyrov to hold any of his people accountable. And similar to numerous other crimes in Chechnya, the attack on Milashina and Nemov will go unpunished. Wooden bunks, stoves and tents, the photos of a camp near the Belarusian town of Asipovichi appeared on the internet. According to some experts, the camp is being built for the mercenaries of the Wagner Group. Although Lukashenko denies that the camp is intended for mercenaries, its existence is evident. Why does Lukashenko need Russian fighters responsible for war crimes in Ukraine, and who will pay them? In these photos, a camp can be seen near the Belarusian city of Asipovichi. The area belongs to military unit number 61732, and it is speculated that it could serve as accommodation for the Russian Wagner private military campaign. I agree with some analysts that there may be a few hundred or a thousand of them here at the most. The rest will sign agreements with the Russian Ministry of Defense or leave the business. And maybe they will go back to their old bases and return to Africa, which is where Prigozhin conducts his operations. They have nothing to do in Belarus. This is their temporary shelter after Prigozhin's failed coup. How many mercenaries could arrive in Belarus? It cannot be determined with certainty. However, the Belarusian service of Radio Liberty has published satellite photos of a camp near the town of Asipovici, showing approximately 300 tents. It is estimated that this camp has the capacity to accommodate up to 15,000 mercenaries. The camp shares similarities with the ones used for training Russian soldiers on Belarusian territory. The key difference is that this particular camp was constructed immediately following Prigozhin's failed rebellion. Recently, 10 billion Russian rubles, equivalent to nearly $110 million, was returned to Prigozhin after being seized during a search. Prigozhin claims that this money is intended to pay the relatives of deceased mercenaries and cover their salaries, which can reach up to $4,000 per month. The question arises as to who will be responsible for paying the mercenaries while they are in Belarus, as there have been no official comments on the matter. However, if they do indeed arrive in the estimated number of 15,000 individuals, it would amount to a monthly cost of $60 million and over $720 million annually. In comparison, Belarus's annual defense budget is $716 million. Considering Lukashenko's aversion to such high expenses, the return of Prigozhin's money may indicate that he will also contribute funds. It is worth noting that in the past, the Wagner Group's operations in Ukraine were financed by the Kremlin. The maintenance of the entire Wagner Group was fully provided by the state. From the Ministry of Defense, from the state budget, we fully financed this group. PMC Wagner operates in different parts of the world, including Libya, Sudan, Mali, Central African Republic, Mozambique, Burkina Faso, Madagascar and Syria. Mercenaries support local authoritarian rulers and participate in their wars. They kill and rob the local population. But their main task in these countries is the development of mineral deposits. The Kremlin benefits from the income generated through these operations. It is possible that both Lukashenko and Putin have plans to further expand these activities. I don't know how Prigozhin sustains his activities in Africa and how low cost this project is for the Russian leadership. It seems to me that the very idea of being there should have been discussed with the Russian leadership, because Prigozhin has been using the weapons provided by the Kremlin. Where does Belarus fit into this scheme? Perhaps Lukashenko will attempt to replicate the Kremlin's project in Africa. He already has a similar endeavor in Zimbabwe, where he is involved in gold and diamond mining with the assistance of the Guard Service Company.
There are alternative theories suggesting that militants could potentially launch attacks on Ukraine or other European countries from the territory of Belarus, disguising themselves as migrants. Lukashenko understands that he doesn't need it, that this is a disaster. The Kremlin also doesn't need it. Why would the appearance of hundreds or thousands of mercenaries change anything? The Kremlin has officially called them traitors. The OSCE has recognized Wagner PMC as a terrorist organization. European politicians also express their concerns about such a presence. It does not seem to offer any benefits for any party involved, including Lukashenko. Moreover, there is a version suggesting that Putin may not fully trust Lukashenko and the mercenaries could potentially exert control over him. It is even speculated that they might resort to eliminating Lukashenko if deemed necessary. In the Ukrainian village of Dniprovska, located on the border with Belarus, residents still have access to Belarusian state TV channels. However, when they see Lukashenko on the screen, all they want to do is to break the TV set. Last year, the inhabitants of Dniprovska were isolated for more than a month by the Russian soldiers who had arrived from Belarus. We went to the village to find out how the attitude towards the country that once was considered friendly has changed here. This is Dniprovske, a typical village located in northern Ukraine on the border with Belarus. The presence of old Belarusian bicycles like the Buso and the slight Belarusian accent among the local residents serve as reminders of the once friendly relations with Belarus. The villagers recall their fondness of Belarusian products and the collective farms that have preserved the Soviet heritage. However, the local residents believe that in February of last year, the Belarusians betrayed their trust. We couldn't even imagine that the Belarusians would stand against us and side with Russia. Lukash is a skunk, a washed-up one. I can't even watch him on TV, he has no conscience. I don't know what to call him, a complete moron or something like that. In March of last year, Russian forces entered Dniprovske, and their military equipment was positioned right in the square near the village council. They went to every yard and asked if there were soldiers. If there was no one at home, they broke down the doors and climbed through the windows. One morning I was woken up by the sound of this commotion. The village lived in isolation for more than a month. No products were brought in and the residents didn't know what was happening around them. We collected the corn that hadn't been harvested before. We ground and ate it, my sweetheart. No one expected that there would be such a war, but it happened that I ended up eating corn with soil. During the occupation, Natalia's primary concern was her son's safety, rather than her own. Her son happened to be at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which was being occupied at the time. He was in captivity for nine months. I was so distressed. I don't know how to describe it. I'm a mother. Whenever there were prisoner exchanges, I cried all the time. I couldn't keep calm. Uh, there were guys with him who lost 40 kilos. My son has lost 18 kilos, but he's little. Beyond the river lies the territory of Belarus, where there is a checkpoint that used to be peaceful. Until February the 24th, for all those years we had daily interactions and we maintained contact with the checkpoint by phone. We had meetings where we discussed joint border protection. This interaction could have potentially facilitated the invasion of the Russians. At half past five in the morning, drones flew into our territory from the direction of Belarus and bombed our tent site. Six of us were wounded. In order to prevent the passage of enemy equipment, the border guards resorted to blowing up the bridge. Dniprovske was liberated on April the 5th of last year, and shortly after, humanitarian aid was provided. It is still possible to receive broadcasts of Belarusian propaganda TV channels or tune in to a Belarusian radio station in the area. Sometimes you turn the TV on and there's a monkey sitting there, so you look for your people. They cheat, do whatever they want, but they can't pull the wool over our eyes. They justify them themselves, but it's not us who came to them. The locals admit that they used to respect Lukashenko, 
but now they feel disappointed. Many have severed ties with their relatives in Belarus who do not believe the stories about the war. The residents of Dniprovskia say that it's unlikely that these connections will be restored. That's all for today. Eastern Europe Review will be back next Sunday. Please stay with TVP World and stand with Ukraine.